This sculpture was commissioned by the Friends of Johnny Mercer to be unveiled on his 100th birthday on November 18, 2009. This was the photograph I was given of Johnny Mercer on Columbus Circle in New York City. We decided that we wanted to make him a little friendlier, and we raised his head so that he would be looking at you when you walked up to him. We wanted him greeting you and being the friendly person that everyone knew him to be. People don't always understand or know the amount of research that can go into making a sculpture. I read several biographies of Johnny Mercer and talked to a lot of people around town who actually knew him and knew his personality and knew what he was like. Everyone always talked about how he had a smile on his face and how happy he always was. So we wanted to make sure that came through in the sculpture. We also need to know what his body type was and what his clothes were that he had on. And I was very fortunate to have um, his great nephew, Steve Girard, who was about his same height and about his same build. So we used him for a model. The Friends of Johnny Mercer committee were very fortunate to have Stratton Leopold on their committee. Stratton is a producer and vice president of Paramount Pictures. He was able to take the picture of Johnny Mercer and Steve's measurements and get me the period clothing from the costume department at Paramount Pictures. My brother, Danny Grantham, is a photographer. We took Steve out and put him on a fire hydrant and documented his clothing. Very important to know how the fabric drapes and fits the body. We took measurements of all the clothing. We measured how far the pockets were from the from the seams, how deep the pockets were, how long the gusset was in the back of the coat, how big the cuff was on the pants. We measured every single detail because I was going to have to send the clothes back. And you also have to document everything in this way because if you sit down and your wrinkles form one way, you stand up, you sit back down, your wrinkles are all in a different place. And I can't have that when I'm working. I need to know that one wrinkle from the front follows all the way around to the back and how it feeds and connects with wrinkles on the side. We also needed to know about the fire hydrant. We were taking all these pictures of Steve and realized that the fire hydrant we were looking at was not the same one in the photographs of Johnny Mercer. I went online and found firehydrant.org. I was able to find the one I wanted, and a nice man on the site actually had one in his yard and was able to go out and measure every tiny little detail for me. I needed a quarter life-size one for the maquette, so I went to my friend Dickie Stone, who works in wood. He got me in touch with the company that makes the hydrants for New York City. I contacted them, and they actually sent me a New York City fire hydrant. I make the armature out of PVC pipe. I can drill through it and heat and bend it with a heat gun. The clay I use is oil-based. It will never dry or harden, and I can heat it to make it soft, and when it cools, it becomes harder, and I can use the tools and get all the details I need. It is not an end product, and it must be molded and cast. When making a sculpture, I always start off with the nude. Um, you need to know what the anatomy is underneath the clothing. You need to know where the knees are, where the hip bones are, in order for the clothes to lay comfortably on that body. You should never start with just putting, making a sculpture with clothes directly on them. I also take the body and I start laying the clothes on whatever's closest to the skin and then working outward. That way you've got the proper layers. I use great big coils to indicate the wrinkles. Fabric is usually close to the skin and all you have are wrinkles that show up that define what the fabric is. So I start with the wrinkles. I am very fortunate to have the best mold maker in the world. His name is Brent Kaufman. Before he ever starts, he talks with the foundry I have chosen and they decide on where to make the cuts for the mold. He comes to Savannah and molds the life pieces on site. This mold took three people 12 to 14 hour days for one week, five days. Rubber is painted on the clay first. He mixes the rubber in a KitchenAid mixer. He starts out very thin layers to make sure to capture all of the detail and the undercuts. Here you can see the breaks and where he has decided to half the mold. The rubber begins to get thicker as he finishes. 
Then comes the plaster, or the mother mold, which holds the mold in place when the clay is removed and also when the wax is poured in. He's now removing the mold, cleaning it up, and putting the mold back together. It normally takes two days to paint the rubber on and two days to paint the plaster, and then one full day to remove and dismantle the entire process. Here he is cleaning up the mold, getting all the pieces that bled into spots where we don't want and separating the different pieces. And they're putting the mold back together to be shipped. Here the, the mold has arrived at the foundry and they're uncrating it. They're getting ready to put the wax in it here. The first thing they do is pour hot wax into the mold. You never want to have a sculpture solid, so you pour the wax so that it is hollow. You pour several layers until you've got the thickness that you're going to want the bronze. Each wax layer is poured a bit cooler so it doesn't melt out the previous wax level. This foundry actually uses different colors so they know at what point in the process they are. Now they're removing the mold from the cooled wax. And once again, you can see how flexible the mold is. Here they are cleaning off the seam lines. You're always going to have little places where the wax has bled through the seam lines, so it has to be cleaned up in this stage. You'd rather have it cleaned up in this stage than in the metal. It's a lot easier now. Now the wax is being dipped in an investment, which is sort of like a ceramic shell. He's pouring the ceramic shell, the liquid, over the, the wax. They get it inside and outside of the wax piece, so they're covering it completely. A fine grit sand gives a ceramic shell some stability. It is dipped in layers until the desired thickness is achieved. This could be six to ten times of repeating this process. The ceramic shell is put in a burnout kiln. This hardens the ceramic shell and melts the wax out. This leaves a hollow core where the wax was. And the ceramic shell is strong enough to hold the bronze, the hot bronze. Silicon bronze is made up of 96% copper and variations of silicon, manganese, tin, and zinc. The bronze is heated to 2,000 degrees in a crucible. The molds are heated so that the bronze won't crack the mold. The bronze is poured into a cup on the mold. They know how much bronze they're going to need by the, how much wax was melted out of the ceramic shells. You don't want to get halfway through a pour and then have run out of bronze. You need the bronze to fill up the entire piece at one time. Here they're removing the investment. It's always horrible to watch because they have all these pneumatic tools and hammers and things and it's really loud and, and I don't know how they don't ruin the pieces, but they don't. But they have to get the investment out of the inside and the outside. Now they weld it all back together. It has to be finished 
so that no one can see the welding lines. And especially when I go back and look at it, I don't want to be able to see any spots where they put pieces back together. They have to match all of my tool lines so that you can't see a break in it. There can't be a little dent or a lack of lines, a smooth place. It all has to be worked out so it looks like one solid piece was cast. They then sandblast the piece to remove all of the oils and debris. Your, your fingertips can get oils on them from handling it and it won't take the chemicals correctly. The piece is buffed with different grits of Scotch-Brite pads to prepare the surface. Different color Scotch-Brites will determine different colors that can end up in the end. The metal is heated so that the pores are expanded and it can accept the chemicals, which change the color of the metal. The chemicals are sprayed or painted on, depending on the effect desired. The chemical colors are layered so that you get a thickness to the color. The final step is a wax that is applied to protect the patina. Here's the piece with its final patina. It's now being crated back for the trip all the way back from Utah to Georgia. He has to be sort of held in there so that nothing can rub or bump. He'll be traveling on a truck. Here he is back in Savannah being installed. On the bottom of each sculpture you have some nuts that are welded in like his feet and in the fire hydrant. And a template is made and holes are drilled into the surface. Threaded rods go up into those nuts and down into the ground. So then epoxy is put down in those holes and the sculpture is lowered down into place. And that is how Johnny Mercer came to be in Ellis Square, Savannah, Georgia.